Mini episode 1771 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1771. This is FDH Managing Partner Rick Morris coming at you here, and we have one of our favorite FDH Lounge dignitaries with us here today, our great friend Fran Stuckberry, sports writer at Our Sports Central. That's OurSportsCentral.com. And uh, Fran covers football at many different levels there, as well as many different levels of many different sports. And I uh, have him on today to talk college football. He's our most regular co- college football correspondent on the show. This is our look at things at midseason and specifically coming off of the epic October 12th slate of games. And uh, we had a lot to really watch and marvel at last Saturday. So this is, again, uh, sort of year one in college football, the new college football with the mega conferences, with uh, all of the major networks, uh, network deals basically in place. You had that transitional year last year where uh, the, the Big Ten was being shared uh, but, uh, still with uh, Disney and the other networks in there. The Big Ten now off of that, but the SEC moving over to the Disney networks this year. And uh, all of that and much, much more to talk about with our great friend, Fran Stuckberry. Fran, welcome back to the show, my man. How are you today? Happy to be here, Rick. I have the catchphrase to tell our listener audience, Fran Stuckberry, the real deal. Um, I love college football. I'm from New York. College football has always been a passion of mine, and uh, it's fun to break it down. And, Rick, this year, like when Vince Man used to say in the 1990s, anything can happen in the World Wrestling Federation. Um, and now it's the same to be case. Anything can happen in college football on a week-to-week basis. It certainly can. And uh, we saw an awful lot that happened last week. And the effect on the standings that that ended up having uh, here as far as uh, the, the rankings, I should say, that was some jostling that happened there. As I told you off air, what I'm going to give right now, I'm going to give a little bit of a preview. We do a weekly college football and pro football podcast on the show, Take Them All Together. So that'll be number 1772, our weekly show coming up. But I am going to debut right now what my top 12 is going to be for the week. And again, this is just what it would be at the moment. So it's not the top 12 teams in order because I've got it slotted in figuring that, again, you're looking at third and fourth uh, place in the ratings, uh, generally speaking, for either the Big 12 or the ACC, and then the 12th spot is going to be reserved for a group of five team because that's probably where they're going to be. So if the playoffs were to start after uh, the slate of games on October 12th, uh, the week of October 12th, I should say, since they played games leading up to it, here's what I have. One Texas two Oregon, three Miami, four BYU, five Georgia, six Ohio State, seven Penn State, eight Iowa State, nine Pittsburgh, ten Indiana, eleven Tennessee, twelve Army. A couple of notes there. It was between Tennessee and Alabama for the last spot there. Alabama limping again this past week. I gave the edge to Tennessee, even though they limped. It was against a better Florida team uh, than who Alabama was matched up with. Right now, I've got Iowa State, Pittsburgh, and Indiana in the playoffs. I don't necessarily expect any of them to be there at the end of the year, but I'd have to put them in right now if the season ended at this point. Penn State, I'm on the fence as to whether or not they'll make it or not, but that's my top 12 as of this moment, Fran. Well, that, that's going to be an exciting time, Brett, because it's going to change a lot between now and when they reveal the top 12. Yes, and uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, back and forth as we go along here. And uh, taking a look at it this past week, the marquee game on a marquee day, it was Ohio State at Oregon, and uh, I was at a watch party with my dad and some of his fellow alums, 
and uh, they were uh, very agitated at various points as the game was going along, and uh, uh, this this one fellow ended up taking his cane and spiking it on the floor at the end of the game can, there. Can, can, can they win the big game? That's the, the two and five against the top five team, the one and five against the top five team. Can Ryan Day win the big game? Well, again, uh, you know, he had beaten Clemson a couple of years ago to make it to the national championship game. He had beaten uh, Michigan in 2019 and in all likelihood would have in 2020 before they basically pushed out citing COVID as a uh, excuse for not playing the game. So I think, again, the true test is going to come on a neutral field. They are no doubt going to match up again in the Big Ten championship game. In Indianapolis, it'll actually be somewhat more of a home crowd for Ohio State, since I know from personal experience that is not a long drive to get to Indianapolis for that game. So that we'll see what happens under those circumstances there. But it was an epic back-and-forth game. If we're going to point any fingers at Ohio State, I think the one thing that would be constant over the last couple of years when they've had trouble in big games, that defense. Uh, they, they just really didn't show up, and uh, again... Uh, they were getting gashed an awful lot by Oregon. So, in particular, that defense has to prove that they can be stout against something other than the good to mediocre to bad teams that comprise the rest of their schedule. Yeah, because Ohio State, uh, they played well, but the clock management toward the end of the game was a little bit horrendous. What killed them was their offensive pass appearance, where the clock ran, and like 20 seconds went off the clock, and uh, Oregon did a little play substitution to get more time off the clock, which the uh, NCAA will change next season. Yes, and uh, it's a loophole that Dan Lanning was smart to exploit, uh, but realistically it probably shouldn't exist, because I remember watching that at the time, not being aware of the rule, and saying, huh, they're not going to put the seconds back on the clock? I mean, I think at that point we all knew that Ohio State was screwed, yet... Will Howard, the way that that went down at the end of the game, taking the drop back, scan the field, scan the field, scan the field, run for it, slide, and then the shocked look on his face when everybody's running onto the field. Like, dude, how long did you think you had? It was six seconds. So he was not operating with any kind of uh, sense of urgency at that point in time. you got to hit like a quick hitter to somebody, have them get out of bounds. You bring on the field goal team with one second to go if you're lucky under those circumstances, but that was one where, again, it went back and forth, and uh, you, you had the feel that whoever had the ball last was going to win, with the caveat being if there was enough time left, and for Ohio State, in large part because, uh, again, they, they coulda, shoulda, woulda ran the ball more, a little bit more under those circumstances. You had a timeout left, and you just had to get into field goal range, and previously, I have faulted Ryan Day that uh, in the uh, national semifinal against Georgia a couple of years back in the Peach Bowl, and then against uh, Michigan, I don't remember if it was last year or the year before, the time when they lost by a field goal, or uh, I, I, I think it was last year, uh, or did it go to overtime? But I don't remember what the circumstance was. They needed a field goal at the end of regulation against Michigan, and it ended up being these monster field goal attempts, and I remember thinking in both circumstances it was kind of cowardly on his part, because then you can just say, oh, well, if the kicker had made it, versus, again, he was not even really trying to get it that far down the field, so that it basically it was laid at the feet of the kicker when it was unsuccessful both times. I didn't have that criticism on Saturday, but I had the criticism that, you know, if you'd have run the ball a little bit more, again, you had that time out to burn. Uh, the passing game was not successful under the circumstances because that's what Oregon was girding up for. Yeah, Oregon was gearing up towards that. College game day was in town. I really like Pat McAfee's enthusiasm. Uh, obviously, in Oregon, that's where uh, the movie National Land, Pooh's Animal House was. He got the fans all revved up with that. Nick Saban adds a little bit of dimension of uh, of our facts and, and a little personality. Uh, we course help. Please get healthier. You, you follow the head gears on, but it's um, Kurt Herbstreit. Kurt Herbstreit. He, who wouldn't want his job? He, he does college football in the NFL. He drives in a Mercedes on the highway. He's on the plane. That, that was a little crazy with him. The camera with him everywhere he went on college game day last week. But I, I also like Pat McAfee's. Um, kid contest, college kids are making $100,000. That can pay for a lot of books, Rick. I can. And, uh, yeah, it was definitely a circus atmosphere in Oregon. Very tough place to play. That's the thing where I can tell you, at the watch party I was at, where those guys, I think, get a little bit too intense about it, there was the sense that the this, this season was over. You and I know that that's certainly not the case. 
they are a strong favorite to be in the Big Ten championship game. And to be honest with you, I expect a different outcome the next time around. I had picked Ohio State at the beginning of the season to be the number two seed in the playoffs, which meant that uh, I thought that they would split with Oregon. I thought they would lose there and win in the Big Ten championship game. I didn't see anything in that game to make me to believe that that can't happen. So that was a big one. You had uh, Texas, Oklahoma, the old Red River. Now they call it shootout because uh, we, we live in this uh, woke day and age where uh, we, we can't, or a rivalry, I should say. I, I, they changed it the rivalry from shootout because that's apparently verboten to do anymore. But anyways, uh, that was one where it is a sense of the divergence between the programs when you look at that there. What has been a pretty competitive game the last couple of years uh, you see the extent to which Texas is number one with a bullet in the, uh, the the rankings here, and Oklahoma is not at this point considered to be a top 25 team. Yeah, I mean, uh, Texas is a real deal with that because uh, they're going to be good for a long time, and they have a future Heisman Trophy winning quarterback in Arch Manning on the bench. He's going to win the Heisman either next year or the year after. Call, I called the here, Rick, and I think you agree with me. Yeah, I think he very well could, and uh, Quint Ewers in the meantime, a heck of a quarterback, and uh, it, again, an epic battle to come this week against Georgia, and uh, this is uh, th- this may tell whether or not Georgia makes it to the SEC championship game. Then again, even if they don't, if they miss it with two losses, they're still in the playoffs, so it's not exactly an eliminator game for Georgia, but uh, tennis, uh, Texas can basically uh, wrap up, I think. Uh, a spot in the SEC championship game if they can beat Georgia. And then, uh, yeah, for Georgia, it'll it'll be a matter of just kind of hanging on if, if they can in this game. They had that big win over Michigan earlier in the season. Uh, Texas did, I should say. And uh, it, it really has been uh, quite a ride for, uh, for both of these teams this year. And, uh, again, Texas really, really looking right now like the number one team in the country. Like you said, nobody goes too deep at quarterback the way that they do. But uh, you got the uh, the Big Ten where it's essentially, I would say, a two-team battle right now, Oregon, Ohio State. Some would say Penn State. I still think Penn State has a lot to prove as far as winning big games. But in the SEC, it's a little bit more wide open. Alabama kind of taking themselves out of it a little bit after the last couple of weeks. My Tennessee Vols not necessarily looking so great either. That inexplicable loss to Arkansas. So the SEC is uh, really shaping up to be, uh, again, what should be, and I thought it would be at the beginning of the season, a battle between Texas and Georgia in the SEC championship game. I think we're going to see this one again. But based on Georgia not beating Alabama before, that's no longer as certain as it was. It definitely is. And plus, this, this week, Rick, we have Alabama, Tennessee, and that loser is going to have two losses. That's going to be tough because, Rick, when we had our discussions off the air, he talked about a word these teams in the SEC are going to cannibalize each other. And that's what's going to happen the next couple of weeks, Rick. They're going to cannibalize each other. There's going to be losses, there's going to be upsets. And it's going to be, it's probably going to, it's definitely going to be a three loss SEC team, SEC team in, the, in the playoffs. Definitely. Definitely, Rick. Yeah, and there probably should be uh, as relates to them versus the rest of the country. But again, there is the chance that the loser of the Alabama Tennessee game will not make it because right now, uh, as I said before, when I was doing my rankings, it's a zero sum game between them right now to qualify. Now, again, you get the teams ahead of them that should lose a game between now and then and potentially take themselves out of it. Pittsburgh, Iowa State, Indiana, that will open it up a little bit more for the SEC. There's some talk about uh, Texas A&M potentially getting back into the mix potentially Mississippi State, but as you go to look at it here, it really is a situation where, you know, ultimately it it, it looks like uh, Texas and everybody else kind of to a degree, but we'll see if that ends up surviving them playing Georgia. Two huge games week after week here. Uh, I know Oklahoma uh, does does not match up with uh, Texas as well this year as they have in years past, but that's still a huge rivalry game, still a huge test and then to have Georgia the week after, it is going to be fascinating to see how the Longhorns come out of the gate. Oh, by the way, as I said before, beating uh, Michigan earlier this season, and yeah, Michigan's not what they were last year in many different ways, but Texas has had uh, a, a front part of the season here that has really been loaded. It's, it's definitely been loaded, and I give Steve Sarkeesian 
all the credit in the world, Rick, because you have Arch Manning on the bench playing well, and he did not give the world a quarterback controversy. Mm-hmm. There's no reason to. Quinn Yards is uh, more than capable of doing the job and winning. The Manning family, they're not jerks, unlike the Sanders family. They're not gonna they're not gonna push it. Get my get my boy to play. They don't want him be on the bench, be ready to play if an injury happens, and then next season he takes over the reins. And uh I see a championship for Texas either this year or next year, Rick. Yeah, and uh again, the uh, the SEC uh again, if somebody can come out of that, they're certainly gonna be battle tested and as you said, I mean the, but the flip side of being battle tested, as you said before, is being cannibalized. You look at uh, the other two conferences that get automatic bids right now. Uh, again, the number three spot, I would give it to Miami, as I said before, in uh, the ACC. Uh, it really sort of looked back in September like they might win the conference by default. But Clemson, after a very early start uh, that was uh, bad, uh, people were burying them and, and talking about how Dabo Sweeney is behind the times with the transfer portal. But uh, again, Clemson has been coming on as of late. Uh, Florida State is at least not losing every game as they were the first part of the season, but they're out of it. Uh, Pittsburgh off to their best start in a long time. Uh, they're bringing back uh, memories of the uh, Tony Dorsett glory days as far as when they were really relevant. But uh, the ACC, uh, a little bit uh, deeper than we thought it would be some weeks ago. In all likelihood, it's going to be Miami in the ACC championship game against one of the, those teams. Well, Rick, I'm going to go Clemson to be, uh, to be Miami ACC championship. Miami's been the Rodney Dangerfield team, surviving against the Virginia Tech on a controversial catch, non catch, they make an amazing comeback against California on the road. Uh, I think it's eventually going to bite them. I, I mean, Clemson's been was sneak, um, you know, had a bad, humiliating week one loss against Georgia, but since then they've been cruising. They have been, and that's one of those things where, again, we have to set our expectations a little bit differently in the 12-team playoff era because uh, games like that are just not going to be disqualifying in this game in this day and age. Now, having said that, a scenario that you're talking about right there, uh, if uh, Miami can win out going into the ACC championship game, that would leave both of those teams with one loss. At this point in time, if you're looking at a one-loss ACC runner-up, I'd be inclined, all things being equal, to put them in the playoff. What say you? I think I think it's possible, especially if these if a, if a team loses three or four, if these teams cannibalize each other like three or four games. It's it's kind of it's kind of wide open. But back on the Big Ten for a second, Rick. I mean, uh, I would personally love to see Penn State host a home playoff game. Imagine that the cold winter weather in Dece- in December against the SEC team, SEC team that's used to the heat. That'd be kind of fun. But um, anything can happen with um, with these sports. Like that one thing we had talked about in the SEC was Vanderbilt being Alabama for, first time in forty years they were twenty four point underdogs. Uh, huge road with Rick for them. And now Rick, it's funny a team wins games and the quarterback can cash in. On name, image, and likeness, like the Vanderbilt quarterback did. So that's kind of funny how that how that happens. Where if you win a big game, you get a little extra money in your pocket. That's right. Uh, in, in today's day and age, that can happen instantaneously. And I'll tell you what, I'll go a step further on what you said about Penn State there, because you're looking at a thing here where, again, depending on who a one-loss ACC uh, runner-up might be. You could be looking at a circumstance here similar to what we've seen in college basketball with the Final Four. In recent years, we have seen North Carolina and Duke matching up in the Final Four. We have seen Kentucky and Louisville matching up in the Final Four. And let me tell you something, man. If we ended up getting Pitt at Penn State in the first round of the playoffs, that would really help to put the playoffs on the map. Oh, Rick, that would be awesome, Kudos to Penn State. Remember when we were talking, we were saying that Penn State really hasn't proven anything. But I think when you go 3,000 miles across the coast and win against USC, USC uh, three fourth quarter losses. Lincoln Riley, he's gonna he's gonna get he's gonna get through the season. But he one of their losses on the, um, in the fourth quarter came to row the boat with uh, Minnesota. And, um, and and another loss came to Michigan, who can't throw the football to the Pacific Ocean. And um, what happened with, with Lincoln Riley, as far as he's concerned, uh, he'll get through this year. He'll get one more year. As Colin Cowherd said, 
Los Angeles market does not support losers. So if they have a struggling year next year, they're going to buy them out. I would agree with that. Uh, the onus is going to be on USC to start to do better. And we're seeing here again that uh, it is not really their year as far as being a serious contender in the Big Ten, nor has it been uh, for the defending college football runner-up, Washington, albeit they have shown this year. They've shown some bright spots here and there, beating Michigan in the national championship game rematch that was this year a conference game. And uh, again, uh, Washington should be poised to get it reestablished in good fashion uh, moving forward. So next year might be more interesting in the Big Ten than this year is because this year, again, it looks like Ohio State, Oregon, and everybody else. Penn State, prove me wrong on that. Uh, Penn State's going to be playing Ohio State in a couple of weeks, and they're going to have to at least play them very, very close if they are going to be taken seriously moving forward. They may still grab the third Big Ten playoff spot here, but uh, that would not necessarily indicate that they're a serious contender because not all 12 teams in the playoff are going to be serious contenders anyways. But uh, we'll see how... That plays out. We said when we did our preview back in August that the most interesting major conference, top to bottom, was going to be the Big 12. And boy, you talk about teams cannibalizing each other because, again, the top teams in this conference just aren't on the same tier as uh, the other conferences here, maybe not even on par with uh, Miami and the ACC. Uh, but I had forecast coming into the year, and I said, oh, one of the biggest games of the year is going to be Utah and Oklahoma State, because most of us thought, a lot of us thought anyways, they were going to be the top two teams in the conference, and uh, it didn't take too long for that uh, theory to get flushed down the toilet, because neither one of those teams is going to be playing for the Big 12 championship game. You've got a BYU squad at this point that is playing very, very well. Right now, I've got them in the fourth spot in my uh, rankings here. You've got Iowa State, who I also have as being an at-large team, a non-automatic qualifier in there, a uh, BYU-Iowa State uh, a game in the uh, Big 12 championship. Uh, you know, that might not spill a lot of beer down at the old VFW Hall, but I think it would be a very interesting matchup, and I, I think it would be... Uh, really sort of a dual underdog type setting as far as two programs that are not highly decorated. I know BYU was once upon a time, 1984 national champions, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, it would be very interesting and entertaining to see two schools like that playing for it. But this is a conference where, again, it's very wide open. Week after week after week, you're seeing teams knock other teams out of contention uh, for the playoff. You're getting games uh, all the time here that are just uh, really, really fascinating to watch. You've got a minimum of like three of them per week, usually at least four. And uh, again, it's, it's a fun conference. As you get later and later into the season, the stakes are not nearly as high because uh, so many of these teams will be out of contention for the Big 12 championship game. But this is the kind of conference that all the way through at least the end of October, when you've still got that getting dangled for multiple schools, it definitely is interesting. Well, Rick, a team we haven't discussed was Kansas State. They're a team that they had a very good victory against Colorado. That's come back, come from behind victory. I think they're going to get in the Big 12 championship game, and they're going to, and they're going to be the uh, representative. I, 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 first, I was leaning towards BYU just for, set, for, for, for kicks, but... Um, it's wide open. This Big Twelve team is wide open, and they're and they're probably going to be a four seed. I, I I think the AC champion will AC champion will definitely be a three seed in that. But um, it's, it's and the Big Twelve is just wide open. Anything can happen with um with this with this conference. Iowa State six zero for the first time since nineteen thirty eight. I mean that's a that's a surprise. I mean when these rankings come out in November, you guys see teams up there that still have chances. But who would have thought in their right possible mind? Um, um, we're gonna have teams like Indiana, Utah, and, and B I mean BYU, and all these other like um, teams that actually have a chance to make the playoff. When uh, a year ago, when we only had four spots, nobody was talking about these teams. True. Yeah. So it it is adding you know a little bit more of an impetus to uh, some of the games as we move further along in in the season because uh, there are schools like BYU and Indiana where that first loss. Uh, you know, in the case of BYU, it could be costly. In the case of Indiana, it will be costly because uh, you know there there may be some conferences where if you're a one or two loss team and you're not in the conference championship game, you may make it anyways. Uh, Indiana with one loss, if they're sitting outside the conference championship 
Maybe they make it if Penn State's got two losses and some of the other teams do. But if I'm Indiana, I wouldn't want to hold my breath. I'd want to do everything I could to settle it on the field. And, uh, yeah, it's just really fascinating watching some of these things play out in these other conferences here. And uh, you get into uh, the group of five. Right now, again, I've got Army as my uh, group of five representative in the playoff. A week ago was Navy, uh, so that could still go kind of either way. People keep talking about Boise State uh, potentially being in there. Certainly Northern Illinois was in there earlier in the year after uh, Notre Dame choked against them. But right now, anybody not named Army or Navy, or uh, and I, I think I think that's about it for the uh, for the undefeated teams. Uh, James Madison got knocked off the perch earlier on. Uh, if you're an undefeated group of five school, you are going to have the twelfth spot because uh, I don't think there's going to be more than one of those teams undefeated. And certainly Army and Navy with them playing each other, that's what makes it fascinating. And then again, people have been talking about this that uh, what happens, how do you set the playoff when they're playing the week after the playoff is set? Uh, They've done this before in the NCAA basketball tournament where a game is considered to be sort of a play-in game. That's essentially what you'd have to do here. If you're the committee, you'd have to say, if they're the last two undefeated group of five schools, it would have to be the winner of the Army-Navy game next week makes it as the 12th seed. Well, Rick, I see... You know, the, um, the team that has control of their own destiny is Boise State. If they win out, they're going to get to that spot. Also, we have to go to Army-Navy. You know who's on the schedule that we haven't even discussed, Rick? I am shocked by this. Our fighting Irish Notre Dame, who got humiliated to, by Northern Illinois, 28 point on the dogs. And the thing is, Notre Dame's not making the playoff. They, they have Army, Navy, Farsi. They're not going to... I mean, are they, they, they don't they have any chance to make this postseason? Yes or no? No, I don't think so, because uh, also the annual game with USC. And that's the thing where you, you could see USC in what has been something of a down year. I don't think it's going to be like, uh, you know, a 6-6 six and six year at the end of the, you know, season for them. I, I, I think it'll probably be more like an 8-4 and four year. So that looks like a game that USC might end up taking just to kind of keep it at that point. So... I think uh, again, interesting that you say Boise State. If they uh, if they run the table, that they would be there. Uh, I think they would need an awful lot of help if you're looking at an undefeated Army or Navy team. Look, there's the possibility, as strange as it is, maybe you get two Group of Five teams in there. Maybe uh, it, it, it goes that way, but you'd have to have enough other major conference teams with at least three losses uh, or. Oh, Rick, um... Well, Rick, or, I mean, Boise State had a great loss uh, against Oregon. They pushed those guys left and right, and and Ashton Gentry went ran wild against them. Uh, and the funny thing is, Army Navy played Notre Dame. I think Notre Dame is going to beat Navy, but the Army game, I think that can be close. I mean, I'm, that's a game where college game day has to go. Army Notre Dame, if, if Army still undefeated, that'd be a that would be one hell of an answer. I'm, I, I think it's in the Meadowlands. I mean, in Jersey, we'll have to check where that game is. Yeah, and that's one where it would be hilarious if game day was there. I always chuckle when they have to go cover the games because, again, uh, Disney loves to give favoritism, ESPN, etc. loves to give favoritism to the games that they have, uh, which means that it's going to predominantly be SEC, but potentially ACC or something else that they have. So them having to go to the Ohio State-Oregon game last week was hilarious to me because that just gives all the more credence to a game that they're not going to cover. Same thing if it's uh, Notre Dame uh, against Army because I don't think they would have that one either. So, well, uh, Rick, I'll, I'll tell you now with the game, but with Navy plays Notre Dame and he's in MetLife and he's Westford, and then um, and then they play Army. Guess where they play him in? New York, the Bronx, the Yankee Stadium, man. I'll Army? tell you one thing: if Army's undefeated, there, that's what college game they has to go. Imagine that atmosphere, uh, undefeated Army at Notre Dame at Yankee Stadium. I'm saying that's what college game day is going to go, Rick. If, if Army's undefeated, um, uh, I think that's going to end up going for, 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 that, for that game. If, if Army's undefeated by then, that'd be one hell of an atmosphere. It's going to be the 1940s all over again, man. Cue up the swing jazz at the tailgate parties, and yeah, a time when. Notre Dame versus Army was actually a super relevant football game. Hard to believe we'd be saying that in 2024, but here we are. So the way that everything is uh, shaking out here, by the way, and as far as games from October 12th of uh, decent significance here, 
Uh, kind of glossed over it before, although you mentioned it a little bit. Penn State going all the way out to the coast. We're getting all these games this year. This is our first look at any number of games that it's like, wow, these are now conference games. And that'll happen next year when we see games for the first time and the year after because not everybody plays everybody. You know, earlier in the year, my Tennessee Vols going to Oklahoma for an SEC game, you know, that was weird. But that Penn State at USC game, first of all, a Big Ten game. Second of all, the Big Ten on CBS at 3.30. That still takes some getting used to. But uh, again, it, it did surprise me that Penn State was able to hang on in that game there. But that is a thing where, again... Uh, I see USC as being on that second tier. I think it's kind of a, a deeper second tier in the Big Ten. You've got Indiana clearly on that at, the, at this point. Uh, you know, you could make an argument. Minnesota has looked like a team on that tier some of the time, sometime not. You could make an argument for Nebraska. I still think Indiana, with all due respect to them being undefeated, that's where they still are. But, uh, again, Penn State is going to have to prove it, particularly in the weeks to come against Ohio State here. Uh, but uh, that could land them potentially, like you said, in the spot to get, because if you're in spots five through eight, you will host a first round playoff game uh, the week, the first weekend of the games here. And uh, yeah, that, that could set Penn State up for it. And maybe even more than that, if they upset Ohio State. Oh, well, that's gonna be a, that's definitely gonna be probably gonna be a, an eight o'clock game and a whiteout probably. That's probably gonna be a one game. That's gonna be that's gonna be a crazy atmosphere. But uh, it's it, it's fun having so much. You know, so many great games to watch. We, uh, we, with this college football playoffs, so many more games to be involved. Now with the Big Ten being coast to coast, we have games all day long. It's, it's an exciting time. One thing I, I did want to discuss briefly in the ACC, a team we have we didn't talk about was SMU. They still have a chance to get the ACC championship. But I'm going to make a prediction after the lounge prediction for you guys. I think that SMU will eventually be in a college football playoff. They're, they're eventually going to you know, win a championship and get to the playoff eventually. They're in Texas. They can recruit. They have a talent. Watch out for SMU for years to come. I know from uh, from checking out uh, some Dallas media, as I do from time to time, that uh, they've really been hyping it up. The program has being in the ACC, and that it's basically uh, you know, the highest level they've been on since they were uh, in the old Southwestern Conference back into the 90s. So they're viewing it as a big step up. While we view the Big 12 and uh, the ACC right now as clearly a cut below the SEC and the Big 10, everything is relative. So it's a jump up for them. It's been hilarious to see also how much the Cal fans have embraced being in that. Cal and Stanford in the Atlantic Coast Conference, you got to love it. And uh, Cal managing to get game day out earlier in the season uh, for uh, a big early season game there. So they're a team that looks like they may, uh, in the years to come, potentially be a contender in the ACC. They may not be that far away you know, at the moment, even though they're not going to make the ACC championship game at this point. So some of these new faces in new places uh, could be set up to contend in these conferences in the years go- moving forward. Uh, it's definitely wide open. It's just between college and Stanford. I think we can talk about the former conference that used to be wrecked, the Pac-12. Let's talk about their new members. Uh, yes, could be uh, Memphis and Toledo and uh, some of these schools among that. Uh, those are the ones I think of when I think of the Pacific 12 conference. But uh, well, they, they took the best teams from Mountain West, obviously, when you have Boise State, Fresno State, San Diego State. Uh, Utah State's aren't one of them, but they needed a team. So, and you have Co- and you have Colorado State, but the thing is, um, you know, the Pac-12 still needs another uh, football program. The Mountain West got um, got UTEP, and now they have Hawaii as a member. Um, it's the thing is, the Pac-12 they, now, um, they took the guy Gonzaga as a basketball program. It's basically a Mountain West co- version. They're not going to get big TV money. They're going to get decent at best. It's just, and, and they're not going to get um. Uh, an automatic bid. They're going to be part of the now group of six for the automatic bid. Yeah, they're going to be. And and that's whole uh, thing, again, you know, the delusion of thinking just because you have the Pac-12 name that you're going to be continue to be treated on that level. That's the reason that this thing fell apart in the first place is because the Pac-12, as it was, wasn't considered to be viable enough on par with the other conferences. And that's when they still had USC, UCLA, Oregon and Washington. So yes, uh, we have 
the Pac-12 game of the year coming up in uh, later November here because it's literally the game of the year. It's the only one uh, when it will be Oregon State and Washington State playing each other. But uh, I understand that the, the games that they've been uh, playing, uh, they have a, C a TV deal with uh, the CW Network, and I guess those games are drawing relatively well on the CW Network, so uh, maybe they would be a contender for the Pac-12. But uh, again, the CW is never going to spend super heavy for anything. They go in and they get sort of like the second and third tier of any number of sporting and sporting-related entities, so I would expect it to be more of the same. And uh, again, my uh, pick at the beginning of the year in the uh, college football playoff was uh, Georgia and uh, Texas in the championship game. So I think they could end up playing three times here. And I had Georgia winning the uh, the championship. Do you have any kind of a sense of how it might shake out at this point, Fran? I think I want to wait till the bracket comes out to see who plays where before I, for, before I see what happens. The thing is, Rick, I'll give the edge to, to the teams that make it to the top four because they play one less game. So I, whoever's the first or second seed, I give them an edge on uh, because it's one less game because a lot of teams are going to get going to get clobbered and bodies going to get brutalized over that uh, that four week period. Well, and I'm going to point this out as well. This is something that uh, FDH director of research Nate Noy had called to my attention previously because that's a guy that will look you know deep at the granular level on just about anything. Is that like? I know we didn't have it play out this way last year in the NFL because the Philadelphia Eagles absolutely collapsed down the strength or down down the stretch, uh, so they weren't able to get past uh, Tampa Bay. But uh, normally, the uh, the team that comes out of the NFC South uh, just gets killed in that first round. Uh, now that may or may not happen this year because Tampa Bay is actually looking like a legit team. But for years and years and years, right, the NFC South champion they get a home game, but they're a sitting duck. And that's what it's going to be with the three and four seeds, because you're going to have, in all likelihood, the runner-up in the Big Ten and the runner-up in the SEC in the five and six spots. So it doesn't matter that the three and four seeds have the bye. It doesn't matter that, they're, that they have the time to rest and prepare and whatever. They're going to be heavy underdogs, notwithstanding the seeding, in all likelihood, to the five and six uh, seeds. Also, Rick, the, the fifth, six seeds are not going to be playing conference champion games. So they'll even have another additional time for a rest. It's gonna, and plus, the other thing is, you're going to be having those those games at bowl sites where yes. where the crowd won't, won't be as much of a factor um, compared um, compared to being on the campus. It's going to be it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. It's going to be uh, I'm going to I'm going to love every moment with, with, with that college football stuff. But um, it's kind of fun to see to see the college football season. The games are getting better each week, and the games are getting even more important towards the end of the season. And now we see as the ACC and Big 12 championship games, basically you win and you're in. You're home and you're sweating on Selection Sunday. Yes. Uh, now, that's an interesting assertion you made that uh, the five and six seeds would not be the conference runner-ups for the Big Ten and uh, the the SEC. My sense is that they will be, certainly in the case of Ohio State and Oregon. I think whoever loses that game is, is slotted into the five and six spot. In the SEC, perhaps it's the third place team from the regular season that doesn't have the stink of a conference championship loss. So I think it's more likely if it happens in one conference or another to be in the SEC because I don't think there's as much separation between Georgia, Texas, and some of the other teams as there is with Ohio State and Oregon and the Big Ten. But uh, we'll see how that shakes out. But uh, the real deal, Fran Stuckberry of Our Sports Central, always a pleasure to have you on the show, buddy. Thank you so much for being here for this great breakdown today. Oh, it's, it's great to be on the show. And like I said, a little advice for people. When you sign a name and image and likeness deal, Make sure it's ver verified and guaranteed because Matthew Sluka left UNLB when he signed, when he clearly was going to get paid $100,000 and he only got $3,000. Now this guy's transferring. I don't know where he's going to play next season, but Rick, anybody, you buy a car, you um, you buy a house, you buy a boat, you sign a contract. So that's a, a knucklehead move of the year in the FDH lounge. Rick. Yeah, I, I learned that the hard way uh, with some friends of mine a couple of years ago when there should have been a contract signed 
uh, to get some work done and did it as a handshake deal. And the stakes on what we were doing were far lower than NIL money for a college quarterback. So yeah, that's a universal lesson, kids. Always get a contract signed when you have anything of any kind of importance whatsoever being done. But uh, again, this show today, really great. Uh, it's wonderful to have you on, Fran. Thank you so much. I will look forward to catching up with you on the show once the playoff field is set. Thank you, Fran. And thank you, everybody, for checking out FDH Lounge Mini Episode 1771.